President Joe Biden's Catholicism continues to be a hot topic in the media, but is his faith influencing his policies? Papal Posse member and editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, Robert Royer, is here with analysis. And the Biden administration has issued a flurry of executive orders in its first week. Some have serious implications on human life and culture and women. National Review's Alexandra DeSantis and author Noelle Maring give us their takes. And finally, immigration reform is a major focus of the Biden presidency. What effect could it have on American life? Deputy Director of Numbers USA, Chris Chimelinski is here with an update. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight. Robert Royal, Alexandra DeSantis, Noel Maring, and Chris Chimelinski are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you can send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'm also on Facebook at Raymond Arroyo. Before we get to all of that, a headline. This week, nearly 200 members of Congress signed a letter in support of the Hyde Amendment which prohibits taxpayer funding of abortions. Each year since 1976, members of both parties, including former Senator Joe Biden, voted for appropriation bills that included the Hyde provisions. Now, during the 2020 campaign, Joe Biden reversed his longstanding support of Hyde, and Speaker Nancy Pelosi said in August she intended not to include the policy in the 2022 appropriation bills. Existing pro-life protections could also be at stake in the new Congress's COVID relief bill, which may not prohibit funding of abortions, abortion providers, and abortion coverage. We'll keep watching that. And Pope Francis commemorated Holocaust Remembrance Day at his weekly Wednesday audience from his private library at the Vatican. 76 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, remembering the genocide against Jews at the hands of the Nazis is an expression of humanity and a sign of civility. Speaking off the cuff at the end of his remarks, Francis also warned that another genocide could happen again. How? By following what he calls warped ideologies that claim to save a people and end up destroying a people and humanity. End quote. In recent weeks, there have been a tsunami of media coverage praising President Joe Biden's professed Catholicism. These pieces claim that Biden's agenda could save Catholicism in America and even Pope Francis's pontificate. Joining me to discuss this and much more is editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, Robert Royal. When I read this, Bob, I thought of you. I want to start with that New York Times piece from this weekend. It reads... Mr. Biden, perhaps the most religiously observant commander-in-chief in half a century, re regularly attends mass and speaks of how his Catholic faith grounds his life and his policies. And with Mr. Biden, a different, more liberal Christianity is ascendant, less focused on sexual politics and more on combating poverty, climate change, and racial inequity. Um, is Biden the most religiously observant commander-in-chief? Bob? Well, to quote a previous president, it all depends what observing. Um, I would start out, I mean, just in general terms, Raymond, if we didn't know he was a Catholic, if he didn't tell us he was a Catholic, what would we see in the way he is acting in office that would give us some sense that he's a Catholic in some distinctive sense? I don't see it, frankly. Mm -hmm. And when the New York Times talks about, you know, less focused on sexuality and, and on these other issues, well, the left and, and the Democratic Party are the ones that are obsessed with sexuality. I mean, it's not just abortion, which I think is what the, the uh, New York Times yeah, we're primarily— get, I, I want to get to that, Bob. Uh, you, you know, you, you, make, you make that good point. But, but uh, stay on this one for a moment, though, trying to cloak these policies and this presidency in this gauze of Catholicism. And, you know, uh, it's one thing to speak about your faith, which, look, I, I think I'm, I'm very pleased to hear people speak of their faith. The question is, does it then have any impact in the works that follow? Or is it just lip service and political, uh, you know, making use of, of, of the faith for political advantage? 
Yeah, they, I mean, this quotation from the New York Times, where he's more focused on environment and and uh, mm-hmm. poverty and immigration. I mean, this is always, it, it it has been, it is, and it always will be a red herring. Because look, uh, I'm a conservative. And I care about the environment, I care about migrants, and I care about poor people, all of which I think uh-huh. are part of what it means to be a Catholic. I may differ uh-huh. with certain Democrats and even certain conservatives about what is the best path, and that's what politics is. It's, it's trying to right. debate what are policies. But these things are not definitive of Catholicism. They are elements, of course, that exist in Catholicism. But the fullness of what the faith is is something quite different. And what they're trying to do, of course, is to, to define or actually redefine Catholicism in a way that just will read out all those things that really challenge and oppose yeah. what are all too comfortable American and Western uh, lifestyles are like. It's those things that are really the, the big challenge and are the most distinctive about Catholicism. And, and that's why I say that I don't see anything, you know, if he believes that, that he's he's on a mission from God, that's good, and I'm glad that he goes to, to Mass every Sunday, but I don't see anything that I regard as distinctive in his Catholicism. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, what do you make of the depiction, and, and the piece tried to do this, that Biden is less focused on sexual politics? And as you mentioned, so far he's signed two executive orders in favor of progressive policies for tran- transgender persons. He's going after the Mexico City policy, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And he stated that he would reinstate the contraceptive mandate and is planning to destroy the Hyde Amendment. It sounds like he's hyper-focused on sexual politics. Yeah. And look, the people he's appointing, too, there's Javier Becerra, who was the uh, attorney general in California, who he's, mm-hmm. he's nominated to become secretary of health and human services. He has no experience dealing with things like the pandemic or you know, running a department like that. But he does have experience in what I would call persecuting the, the little sisters of the poor. I mean, the Little Sisters of the Poor do very good work with old people and with poor people. And why should they and any other religious body that objects to it have to be forced to pay for contraception? I mean, th- this is the the defenders of, of uh, the president's Catholicism say he is not trying to impose his Catholicism on, uh, on others, on America. And that may be true, but he certainly isn't. He certainly is imposing this gender ideology and met much else that lots of us object to and feel it is no place of the federal government to be to be directing us to follow. I and mean, why should we be told by our federal government that we have to pay for abortions or contraception that, that goes against our consciences? Mm. Bob, several other periodicals, uh, America Magazine, The New Yorker, made comparisons this week between Biden and Pope Francis, echoing this idea that was spelled out in The New York Times. And they all picked up on this, this uh, line of thinking. Uh, The New York Times writes, while conservative Catholics have doubled down on abortion policy and religious freedom for the past four years, Mr. Biden's priorities reflect those of Pope Francis, who has sought to turn the church's attention from sexual politics to issues like environmental protection, poverty, and migration. Now, Bob, while the pope may advocate for immigration and the environment, which is perfectly within his purview, it is a complete distortion to suggest that the pope is jettisoned Catholic morality or church doctrine a la Joe Biden. But I'm going to let the audience decide. This is the pope on marriage. Okay, listen. The family is also threatened by growing efforts on the part of some to redefine the very institution of marriage by relativism, by the culture of the ephemeral, by a lack of openness to life. And here he is on abortion, Bob. The Pope said, I ask this question, is it right to cancel a human life to solve a problem, any problem? No, that's not right. Rent a hitman to solve a problem, one that kills human life? This is the problem of abortion. And this is Pope Francis on gender theory. He said, a great enemy of marriage is gender theory. Today, there's a global war out to destroy marriage, not with weapons, but with ideas. We have to defend ourselves from ideological colonization. Please don't say the pope sanctifies transgenders. I want to be clear. It's a moral problem. It's a human problem, 
and it must be resolved always can be with the mercy of God, with the truth. He said that in Azerbaijan in 2016. Robert, how does any of that square with what Biden is proposing vis-a-vis uh, -vis gender or abortion, et cetera? Yeah, I think that you're quite right to point to all these statements that the Pope has made. Now, the one place, I think, where there is some, some plausibility to the argument that the defenders of the president are bringing forward is that the Pope has not been as forceful in pursuing those um, culture, we can call them culture war elements, uh, as he has other things. He hasn't written an encyclical on, for example, uh, the environment. He wrote an encyclical on the environment, but he hasn't done one on, say, gender ideology, although other elements in the Vatican have published mm -hmm. documents. About it. He hasn't done, I mean, I think that abortion, anybody who's a clear thinker, you don't even have to be a Catholic. You just have to understand what is at stake, that innocent human life is being destroyed. That is the most clear way in which human life is being disrespected in our time. And I would urge mm -hmm. anyone who's listening to this in, in Rome that it would help a great deal if the Pope would put greater emphasis on that. He can still pursue those other interests that he has. I mean, I'm interested in the environment. I'm interested in the way the family is going to be reconstructed. There are many other things. But this ideological redefinition of sexuality, um, this ignoring of the largest number, this, it's something like 60 million children are killed in the womb every year or globally, not here in the United States, obviously. Mm -hmm. we, we, on, we only kill about a million. Um, to me, if, if there were a war going on and 60 million people were dying there every year, we would all rightly be, be outraged. And I think that the Holy Father and the way he acts, speaks, and publishes should reflect the urgency and, and the size of that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there, Bob, there's a there's a misunderstanding, I think, in the media and maybe in the culture at large, that if the pope says it or doesn't say it, that that somehow changes Catholic doctrine or teaching. That is not the case. The pope, pope could fall mute tomorrow. Catholic doctrine remains what it is, and life will always be protected from, from, from conception to natural death. That's a priority for the church, as the bishops have taught recently. Uh, what is the media trying to do here, Bob? Uh, uh, trying to wrap Biden in this faith. You remember Amy Coney Barrett was mocked for her Catholic faith. Now Biden is being celebrated. Is this a way to try to confuse the pious or an attempt to revive the so-called religious left? And is there a religious left to speak of at this time? Well, there is. It's small, but it has access to uh, outlets like the New York Times and, you know, major news media. That point okay. of view gets it gets uh, transmitted through universities, often even Catholic universities, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and uh, also through our, our popular culture. So, look, it's there. It, it has an outsized voice. But I, I think that the, the mere fact of the matter is that the the active Catholics, particularly here in the United States, we know that in, in the voting, uh, Biden and Trump basically split the vote. It's hard to say within a few percentage points mm -hmm. which way they're. What the outlets like the New York Times and others are trying to do is put their thumb on the scale a little bit and, and say, see, you can be a, a leader, probably the leader of the entire world, and still be a left-wing Catholic. Now, in places like Argentina, the Pope's own homeland, um, mm -hmm. and places in Europe, uh, Catholics have sort of made their peace with uh, leaders who are, are pro-abortion. And I, I think in this case, we've seen already in what the Biden administration is doing, that this is more than simply tolerating abortion. I think it's actually uh, advancing and pushing it. You know, they, they, either they assume that mm -hmm. this is a way to control poverty or to, you know, to deal with other problems that arise from, from what are so-called unwanted pregnancies. But we here in the United States have never accepted that. We've had the Hyde Amendment, which says, OK, the compromise is there are all these people who are pro-abortion. There's nothing we can do about that in the short run, although we're going to try to evangelize mm -hmm. So uh, what, what do we do? OK, it's legal to have an abortion, but we're not going to make people pay for this. You want it, you pay for it yourself. Right. That, I think, we mm -hmm. see is now being threatened. And obviously, the, the main parts of the mainstream culture want to see things move in that direction, even for the church. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's... It's, it's unbelievable, the breathtaking speed of this. But look, I, I'm not 
at all disturbed by this, Bob. I knew this was coming during the campaign. We talked about some yeah. of these things. This is what Biden talked about. We knew who was behind this run. And it's the same people that were part of the Obama administration. So none of this is surprising. In a recent book on Biden and Catholicism, theologian, I use the term loosely, Massimo Fagioli writes, the fate of Biden's Catholicism in America is interwoven with the fate of Pope Francis's pontificate. That is its long-term fate, even after the next conclave. Both depend on what will become, in the United States, a Francis's proposal of an anti-ideological and anti-moralistic Catholicism. So let me get this straight up. Biden will determine the outcome of the next conclave. What do you make of this? Well, look, I read parts of that book. I haven't had time yet. It just came out to finish the whole thing. And look, he's a scholar. And, and for a foreigner, he understands a good bit about what's going on here in the United States. And I applaud him for that. I've spent a lot of time abroad, and it's very hard to understand a, a foreign mm -hmm. culture. But All what right. I, I don't think he gets right is the way he tries to read from a, a European perspective certain things that are happening here and apply them to the Holy Father. For example, he says at one point that the Jesuit order will be the, the, the global voice of Catholicism into the future. I mean, the, glo the Jesuit order is, is, is plummeting and just in terms of the number of Jesuits there are in the world. And I don't see how they're the global voice. I mean, Father Martin, of course, is a voice here. Uh, Father Spadaro in Rome, the Holy Father himself is a Jesuit. But I don't see that religious order defining much of anything. The other oddity, for a person who actually does have some insights into American Catholicism, is that he thinks that our, our generally more conservative than European bishops here in the United States are part of what he calls a, um, an intransigent neo-19th century Catholicism. Now, this is extremely odd. You know, America yeah. is, is quite a bit different from Europe. And the idea that, that say, a, a figure like Archbishop Chaput, who's very sophisticated, very pastoral, mm -hmm. understands very well, you know, what's at stake, is somehow an intransigent from two centuries ago? This is, this is ridiculousness. Now, what, the fact that, that Biden, as, pre, as president, is a Catholic, is going to have an influence in the world. There's no question about yeah, that. But I agree. as you pointed out in those quotations, the Holy Father himself, even if it hasn't been noticed, has made some pretty strong statements against the kinds of things that, that President Biden and his administration yeah. are seeking to impose on the country right now. So to, to identify the two of these may be a pious wish on his part, but I don't know that even the Vatican is going to be all that flattered to hear that. Well, the, the idea that you would identify a political leader and a broken down, you know, kind of guy who's been around the track many times as somehow the vehicle that will rescue and and carry Pope Francis's pontificate forward in time is a real bad bet to, in my, to my eye. I mean, look, John Paul II and Reagan worked together. They had a common enemy in atheistic communism. Uh, I, I don't see what the common enemy here is, unless you're talking about traditional people of faith or religious people, which is who Biden has identified as the enemy, clearly. I mean, he's called them domestic terrorists in some respects. This, the, and, and you touched on a point, Bob, and I want to delve into this in our remaining minutes. The bishops have already confronted Biden on what they term moral evils embedded in his policies. I'm talking about the U.S. bishops here. Bishop Gomez's statement last week. Does this entire project put the bishops in a bad spot? Now, I would argue it puts them in a good spot because it, it enables them to say what is good in you know, attempts to deal with people who've been marginalized and whatnot. And there should be a debate about how we go about handling those things, as, as I said earlier. But it also gives them a chance to, to put forward a strong voice about what's going on uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Look, one of the things Fagioli points out quite rightly about the United States is that our, again, more conservative, although not uniformly conservative uh, bishops here in the United States, resemble things more like the global south. In other words, if you want to find up, uh, if you want to find a set of bishops that are going to stand up to homosexuality and transgenderism, which they're going to regard as crazy and abortion, it's going to be Africa, and it's going to be Asia, and it's going to be parts of Latin America, maybe not necessarily Argentina, where the Holy Father is from. And mm -hmm. if that's the case, if it's the case that in America we're, we're, we resemble the, the global south more than 
the the, the uh, uh, postmodern uh, West, this really means to me that though that part of the world that is growing in Catholicism, there is, are there are going to be more Catholics in sub-Saharan Africa in 2100 than there are in the entire world right now. So that's the growing and faithful part of Catholicism. To, to think that, the, that somehow this, this interim, and it's probably going to be four years of Joe Biden, is somehow the vehicle that is going to carry forward some other Catholicism, even just in the weight of those demographics, I, I think it's, it's very much wider the mark. And, and we will see as time goes on, many people have said this about other uh, denominations in Catholicism, that the more conservative um, of Christianity, the more conservative uh, forms of Christianity are flourishing the ones that are not faithful to the gospel are dropping away because they become one with the, the surrounding culture, mm -hmm. which is not particularly Christian. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the history of this is going to go in a quite different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, Archbishop Cord Leone uh, put out a statement last week after Speaker Nancy Pelosi accused pro-life Catholics who voted for Trump as selling the whole of democracy down the river for, quote, that one issue, abortion, end quote. The archbishop wrote, Nancy Pelosi does not speak for the Catholic Church. She speaks for a, as a high-level, important government leader and as a private citizen. And on the question of the equal dignity of human life in the womb, she also speaks in direct contradiction to the fundamental human right that Catholic teaching has consistently championed for 2,000 years. He said this on Shannon Bream's show. My concern that she's misleading Catholics into thinking that they can be good Catholics and acceptable to favor abortion. But let's face it, abortion is just blatantly evil. Bob, is this a predicate, this warning? Is this a predicate for a more serious warning for Nancy Pelosi, like a denial of the sacraments? Well, I would hope that it was, but uh, that is going to be the Rubicon because it's easy, easier to talk. It's not easy even to say what the archbishop just said, and I think that was terrific, what he just said. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but it's easier to talk than actually to do some. Um, my, my dear friend, the late Cardinal Francis George of Chicago, used to bring in the Illinois uh, congressmen and senators and talk with them about how they were endangering their souls. But he wasn't willing to go that further step. To, to I think he actually warned them not to come forward for communion, but they never observed it. Um, it, it would take something very serious, I think, to, to uh, get our bishops to that point. They don't seem to, to want to take that step. But from what we've already seen, and it's, what, just a few days uh, of the Biden presidency, we've already seen them doing. And I hope I'm wrong about religious liberty, but I think that they are going to really put pressure on not only the Little Sisters, but hospitals and schools and universities and, Absolutely. and you know, religious I mean, they're going to be going after all of these things, and we're all going to be required to pay for contraception and abortion. I think that, that if, if, in a way, this could be a, a critical moment where our bishops, our good bishops, could step forward and say this far and no farther. We're with you. Archbishop Gomez is is born is was born in Mexico. He's very pro um, taking care of the poor. I assume that he's concerned about the environment, but his statement, um, which was temporarily blocked, as we all know, for last week before the, the, the Vatican right. wanted to get a, a, a statement in first. I think his statement was terrific. And if I were him and, and, the, and somebody called me from Rome and said, you know, you shouldn't do this, I would say, look, we're Americans. We understand our, our place and we understand where our church should be here. This is not a matter of any doctrine. It's not a matter of mm -hmm. discipline. We are talking to, to a Catholic as the shepherds who have been designated for the United States of America. This is an opportunity it's going to be a tough time for our bishops and all of us lay people and Catholics. And I think for people who are resistant to the way that the culture has been going for a long time. But this is our moment. This is our moment to actually stand up and say yeah. something that might actually convert. Bob, Cardinal Wilton Gregory in D.C. has said he will prefer dialogue with the new president rather than rescinding the sacraments or making threats of the sacraments against him. If that is the stance... What does communion really mean for the Catholic in the United States? Does it mean you don't have to be in communion with the church on belief, practice, public uh, activities, et cetera? Well, look, I don't want to be flip about this, but if, the, if, if there's going to be dialogue, I think the first sentence that the, the cardinal ought to utter to Joe Biden is go to confession 
and make a firm resolution not to sin any any longer. Because if, you, if you're going to be the president of the United States and simply adopt what your party has taken to be the cutting edge of where it's going to go over the next four years, and you're just going to ride roughshod, I, I think it's, look, I, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I, I think it's already clear just in these, these few days that, that any dialogue is going to take place is going to take place on stuff that we already know we can talk about. We can debate about, you know, what environmental policy or, or immigration policy mm -hmm. ought to be. Yeah. It's those particular things that Catholics uh, who are standing up for the natural law, look, abortion is not about sex. Abortion is about violence. Abortion, of course, right. is the, 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 last, uh, the last line of defense of the, of the sexual revolution in that, you know, if you get pregnant, having done something, you can, you can kill a baby through, through abortion. But it's not primarily about sex. We're talking about protecting innocent human life. And that would have to be the beginning of, of the dialogue. I have a feeling that in any so-called dialogue or negotiations or compromises that are going to be made will not really be in good faith. And I'm sorry to say that, because I, I think that it would be helpful if we could have some sort of rational conversations in the United States these days. But I don't see it happening. Well, I think Cardinal Dolan was right when he said you can't support the death penalty for the unborn. You know, you can't be opposed to the death yeah. penalty and then support it for the unborn. And as, as Archbishop Cordelioni uh, mentioned the other day, I've never met anyone, he said, who's personally opposed to slavery but supports it. I mean, it, it, you know, this would be an outrageous concept if you articulated that. And yet, that is exactly what these politicians are doing vis-a-vis -vis the abortion. We'll leave it there. Robert Royal, his commentary is at thecatholicthing.org. Bob's latest book, Columbus and the Crisis of the West, is available at bookstores everywhere. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Raymond, see you. Pro-abortion protesters disrupted the Respect Life Mass at St. Joseph's Cathedral in downtown Columbus, Ohio. Bishop Robert Brennan was presiding at the event, marking the 48th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Protesters stormed into the sanctuary carrying signs. The signs read, fund abortion, not cops, and abortion on demand. End hide now. Some of them shouted, 2468, this church teaches hate. The protesters were escorted out by local police and diocesan staff. In his first two weeks in office, President Biden has signed executive orders touching on gender and promising to repeal protections for the unborn. What will be the fallout of the president's new executive orders and what might the administration do next when it comes to life and gender? For answers, we're joined by visiting fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and writer at National Review, Alexandra DeSanctis, and author of the upcoming book, Awake, Not Woke, Noel Mehring. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, Biden has made it clear that he will rescind the Mexico City policy. Now, this prohibits U.S. funding of foreign uh, organizations that promote or perform abortions. Now, we've seen this policy flip back and forth from Republican to Democrat since Ronald Reagan announced it in 84. What are the real consequences of this? Alexandra, I'll start with you. You know, this is a really big uh, policy change. This is something that President Trump, in fact, expanded uh, under his administration. He sort of uh, increased the, the pot of U.S. foreign aid money that was covered by the Mexico City policy, meaning even more U.S. aid was forbidden from covering abortion overseas. This is a huge deal. This means now, you know, once Biden flips it back, U.S. aid money will once again be going from the State Department, USAID, all these other groups, to groups that either perform abortions abroad or promote them. So this means groups like the International Planned Parenthood Group, um, Marie Stopes International, which has since been renamed. These sorts of groups will be getting U.S. funding again. U.S. taxpayers are indirectly underwriting abortions uh, or, or groups that promote abortion all around the world. Mm. On Tuesday, 197 House Republicans sent a letter to House and Senate leaders of both parties in support of the Hyde Amendment. Now, uh, I knew Henry Hyde. He attached this to appropriation bills to prohibit federal funding of abortions. Now, after long support for Hyde, Biden has said he's going to do away with the Hyde Amendment. And Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she said she would not attach it to the 2022 spending bills. For a pair of Catholics, this is pretty stunning. Um, uh, Noel, your take on this, uh, why this advocacy for abortion? It's not only passively accepting something that's out there, but 
th these are two Catholics, Pelosi and, and Biden, advancing the cause here and funding it. Right. It's beyond personal disagreement, right? They're asking to imp for us all to be implicated and also to promulgate this across the globe with the Mexico City policy in a way that, uh, you know, oftentimes is offensive to the indigenous people who have sensibilities that are not wanting to be ideologically colonized in this way. So Biden's in a pickle, right, because surely he knows that this is not a mere policy issue. Abortion itself is not. It's not like ec economic policy or immigration policy where people can prudentially disagree. Abortion is a fundamental principle that in violation of human dignity that the Catholic Church that he professes stands strongly against, and there's no room for disagreement there. So his uh, response, or his, through his press secretary on this matter, was deeply concerning, and this bizarre non sequitur, when asked about it, he's replied that, she replied about him, that he is a devout Catholic and he goes to Mass. So, you know, first and foremost, that's you know not addressing the actual question, which is how does he reconcile this and what will the policy look like? But rather, it's sort of reflecting the success of privatization of religion to become totally relativistic, uh, that where religion has no place to say anything on moral ground, has no truth to pr promote because it's divorced from reason um, and divorced from the common good. Um, and that's, an, that's a nice mm -hmm. shield. But if you think about it in, 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 the, in a different light, for example, if a president was supporting slavery and he, when asked about it, he said, well, I'm a devout Catholic. You know, that would be galling, to say the least, you know, that we, that to, to be able to separate these things and, and to somehow think that that's the new Christian left. Alexandra, why didn't the Republicans codify Hyde into law when they had the chance? They had both houses of Congress and the White House. Why didn't Paul Ryan do this? You know, I, I think, honestly, this is an issue where Republicans didn't realize perhaps how radical the left was becoming on this issue. It was only just in, in 2016 that the Democratic Party, for the first time, put into their party platform the desire to federally fund uh, abortions for low-income women through Medicaid and, and Medicare. Um, and, you know, I think Republicans probably thought, look, this has been a, a bipartisan compromise for so long, for decades now. Democrats routinely vote for spending bills that have the Hyde Amendment. In fact, President Barack Obama and his budget proposal included the Hyde Amendment. So this was something, there's been a bit of contention about it, but by and large, um, it, there's been bipartisan support for this policy for a long time because it's really more about conscience rights than it is about abortion as such. And, and I think they probably made a mistake in assuming or, or not noticing perhaps how quickly the left was beginning to radicalize on the issue. Mm -hmm. Ladies, in a recent panel discussion, uh, Sister Simone Campbell, who's a progressive advocate, uh, said that the political obsession with outlawing abortion has broken the church apart. She said this about Biden's approach to life and abortion. Listen. He has a very, I know from a conversation with him, he has a very developed approach to it. And for him, it hinges on religious liberty and that he will not force his religious belief on the whole nation. <laughs> Have you ever heard the idea, well, he has a very developed approach to child abuse? I mean, is this sustainable from a moral perspective? Uh, Noel, I'll go to you. Certainly not. I mean, th this is the problem, is that the severe injustice of introducing abortion into law has created a rupture where there is no harmony to ultimately be had. We can sort of patch over it with conscious rights, which are important. But ultimately, the, the, the left, this is the crux of the sexual revolution. It's the backstop that allows the sexual re revolution to be propped up. You remove abortion, and then they expose the, the folly of the whole, of the whole um, revolution. So they have to keep this in place. So to call that a developed policy is a bizarre. And also to say that he is, it's for the sake of religious liberty is very bizarre, given that, that this really is something that's going to erase religious liberty, ultimately, with either through the attacks on conscious rights and what we've seen happening to the Little Sisters of the Poor uh, and, and Christian colleges. So um, it's a little bit backwards, but that's sort of what the left's MO is, right, is that they call what is love hate and what is hate love. And so this is sort of consistent with that ideological problem. Mm, yeah. Well, Noel, I was, I was going to ask you about that. You know, how, how does this idea of religious liberty extend to uh, the contraceptive mandate, uh, gender, teaching the science when it comes to gender? I mean, isn't all of what we're seeing out of this administration so far, isn't this all imposing views, moral views on society? Absolutely. And that's a, a fundamental problem. I think that we, you know, they prey upon our, the American citizens' desire to be, you know, not a bigot and to be compassionate to people. 
but they take that natural and good desire and they twist it by d d uh, um, saying that, you know, this is just a movement for the sake of including this small group of people who deserve our compassion. They certainly do deserve our compassion. But that's not actually what the movement is saying. They are, it's an ideological bomb that is forcing all of us or trying to force all of us to disorient and disrupt any uh, whole understanding of human personhood and human dignity, a bodily dignity. And once we, you know, they want us to think that we can be anything in order to, to say that we can be nothing. And that's ultimately what's at the end of this road is that uh, is a total nihilism where the body means mm -hmm. nothing. And it's consistent with the secular revolution, which has been telling us for years that our body has no meaning other than what we choose to give it. Speaking of gender, I want to move on to this executive order banning discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. President Biden signed it this week. Now, this order will extend federal non-discrimination protections to members of the LGBT community, including sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression as well. Now, this executive order essentially allows biological men who identify as women to compete in women's sports, et cetera, and vice versa. What are the implications here? Uh, Alexandra, I'll start with you and then to Noel. You know, I think this is a really difficult issue because it's clear here where the kind of uh, coalitions within the progressive movement are on a collision course. You have on one hand feminists who are saying women's rights are so important and women's privacy and women's bodily autonomy. And then on the other hand, you have activists who are insisting that to respect the rights and dignity of, you know, individuals who identify as transgender or as the opposite sex, uh, we must kind of remake our norms in public institutions to kind of fit their idea of self or the conception of their gender. Um, those two things cannot coexist when the policies you're demanding are to let biological men onto girls' sports teams or to let them into locker rooms or bathrooms or girls' dorm rooms. And, and the logical extension of such a policy is exactly that. It's that colleges, regardless of perhaps their religious affiliation or, or what have you, even just their judgment, uh, now can no longer have sex-segregated spaces. And I think it's pretty clear that there are good reasons to do so, not the least of which are uh, women's rights to safe spaces, to privacy, and to I think um, girls especially have a right to compete, or if not a right, they should be able to expect they can compete against people who are similar athletic ability. And, and simply, they're just not going to be able to do that if biological men are permitted to compete against them. Noel, I've heard arguments where people say, look, uh, these are people who are uh, suffering from some sort of dysphoria. They, they, they're going through a transition here. And this is fair. This is the government saying we're leveling the playing field. You would say what? Well, you know, I, I think it's it's fair that we should treat them with great dignity and compassion. Uh, the thing that's not fair is that we don't want to exist outside of reality, right? And, you know, as, for all the talk of following the science, you know, this is biological science that we all know intuitively. You know, even as children, you understand what is a boy and what is a girl. So while, you know, this the, the person who's suffering this dysphoria should be given all the compassion and help and aid that they need, I think to... to um, to help them in the, to that deception and to convince all of us that this is the right thing to do is ultimately going to be the downfall of, of, of great things in our culture, because really we really cannot sustain the, a lie like that. And the Catholic Church is called to think with reality, ultimately, with science, with reality, with philosophical principles and theological ones. Um, but these things are all cohesive. And once you rupture those things, then, as Alexandra said, you start having the movement turn against itself. It starts to eat upon itself. And that's what you see happening with the feminists and the transgender rights people right now, is that these things cannot be harmonious because they're fundamentally not in a harmonious ide ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what about boys? I mean, we've seen the dismantling of organizations like Boy Scouts of America as a result of this gender ideology. Uh, Alexandra, where does this go? What's the next step here? You know, I think it, it does, in fact, cut both ways. You're right. I, I tend to think of it in terms of how this could harm girls and women because of the, the obvious biological disparities between men and women if you're putting biological men into female spaces. But it does cut against men as well. Uh, for instance, could you have any longer a, a single-sex college? Could boys have any space that belongs just to them? The idea that a girl could be part of Boy Scouts just changes the nature of the organization, changes what men are participating in. And I think, obviously, the, the genders are complementary and both need each other. But we can see as a society it's important to have spaces where one can exist without the other for different purposes. And I think the end of this road is, unfortunately, that those spaces are going to have to be either erased or altered pretty fundamentally.
Mm -hmm. um, uh, Noel, I want to talk for a second about the, the wider reach of this uh, gender ideology, these theories that we're seeing move into public policy. I mean, we saw Speaker Nancy Pelosi introducing gender neutral language in the new rules of Congress a couple of weeks ago, and now the Biden administration has asked staff to choose their personal pronouns. How does this move into everyday life? Is this just going to become the default all across society? Well, I think that's certainly what they want. And I think that the only way that we fight against that is by having the courage to not go along with it. Because the only way that, you know, this is an ideology that's fundamentally a lie. The only way that a lie is sustained is by silencing opposition. So, you know, that's why you see uh, when somebody is confident that they are expressing something that's true and that's for the common good and for the good of all people, they're not afraid of dissent and disagreement. And I think that's why we're seeing so much fear and silencing right now. It's because they know that it's sort of a, ho a house of cards. But it is also a Trojan horse. So once you insert this ideology, ideology with these, you know, gender pro the neutral, gender neutral pronouns, you really start to um, bring, uh, have people swallow a whole host of lies that they don't understand that they're swallowing that have a far-reaching meaning about the human person and the dign dignity of the person. And once you dismantle that understanding, then you end up being able to instrumentalize the human person in a ways that are quite scary and press and there's a lot of precedent for being wary of this road. Mm. This past March, a United Nations report addressed gender-based violence and discrimination. Um, it criticized, quote, religious interest groups and individuals who invoke religious tenets as well as pseudoscience to defend traditional values about social roles of men and women and to oppose gender ideology in ways that intimidate or stigmatize critics. Now, in response to this, Archbishop Ivan Jerkovic, the Vatican observer at the UN agencies in Geneva, said, particularly unacceptable and offensive are the numerous references that recommend that freedom of religion or belief and con conscientious objection must be surrendered for the promotion of other so-called human rights, which certainly do not enjoy consensus, thus being a sort of ideological colonization on the part of some states and international institutions. Um, I want both of you to reflect on this pitting of religious freedom against this gender redefinition. What do you, what do you expect here in the United States from this administration in the days ahead? And are we going to see more of this collision of rights and values here? Alexandra, I'll start with you. You know, I think, unfortunately, what we're going to see in the realm of gender and gender ideology is very similar to what we've seen with abortion. And, and what you mentioned, mentioned that quote from Sister Simone Campbell earlier, I think on abortion, the left has managed to uh, sort of implicate religion in the pro-life movement in such a way where they can dismiss opposition to abortion or dismiss pro-life views as just this kind of old, outdated religious view. And if you say you're pro-life or you oppose abortion, you must just be kind of a weird religious person and you can't impose your values on us. This is exactly what Joe Biden is trying to do to cover for, you know, being supposedly a devout Catholic and also pushing uh, unlimited abortion funded by the taxpayer. And I think we're seeing the exact same effort happening when it comes to gender and what it means to be human. And you don't have to be religious or Catholic to understand that men and women are separate, distinct uh types of people, right? That it's different to be a man, it's different to be a woman. We can know what those categories are. And that's something fundamental about what it means to be human. Sex and gender are real defined categories, biologically mm -hmm. speaking. And mm -hmm. so if we're going to erase that, I think a huge part of the left strategy is going to be to, to characterize as a, an imposition of religious views, the idea that sex and gender have any meaning other than whatever we feel like making them. Mm -hmm. Noel, uh, th this has implications, no doubt, on Catholic and religious institutions that teach the natural law, that sex is uh, a binary biological cares characteristic of the human person. You know, what kind of backlash do you foresee here for those institutions? Well, it seems almost like the ceiling's too high, right? Because once you do away with a common understanding of natural law, then what authority do you have to... Uh, uh, keep you in check, right? The natural law is inherently um, something that all people are under and have to have to respect in order to have any sort of moral framework. So once you take that off, it becomes quickly something that becomes all about human power. 
Um, so I, I think that from their perspective, there's not there's not much that where road that they wouldn't go down as far as this uh, this ideology goes. And the only the thing that will be a limiting principle will be the American citizens pushing back against it and finally saying, no, I won't be intimidated and told that I'm a bigot by acknowledging things that are basic matters of science and biology. And that doesn't mean that I'm not compassionate. It just means that science matters and biology matters and reality matters. And it's not helpful for our, our country or our culture to deny those things. Uh, and secondarily, mm -hmm. the natural law, you know, that we have to have principles in order to sustain any sort of moral norms. And once you let go of those principles, then you walk down a road of consequentialism. Um, and there, this is a very dangerous road. So uh, I just think that we have to understand that our natural instincts and our common sense and our under innate understanding of, of consciousness, our conscience, are, are things that are really in our favor, and we have nature on our side. So we, we ha all we have to do is not be afraid, I think, and uh, bullied by these tactics that are really uh, tactics of a demagogue. Mm. Well, you know, as my friend uh, Father Richard Newhouse would say, this is a Catholic moment. I mean, this is a moment when the church is challenged and needs to rise up and clearly articulate the truth. I mean, uh, I, I've read a lot of commentary in the past week from s s Catholic writers, presumably or avowedly, uh, and they say that there was a neo uh, theocracy that that uh, was being neo conservative theocracy that was being pushed earlier. Uh, if they're trying to label what you know, the 80s and 90s as that, well, then this is clearly a, a relativistocracy underway here, where we have everybody pushes their agenda and calls it, wraps it in a religious gauze or a religious trapping. Alexandra DeSantis, Noel Maring, thank you both for being here. Thank you. I will introduce an immigration bill immediately and have it sent to the appropriate committees to begin movement. A very determined Joe Biden announcing his plan for immigration reform just prior to being sworn in as president. With intense opposition from the GOP minority, will reform be part of a large sweeping immigration bill or a series of smaller scale legislation or executive orders? And how will all this affect regular Americans? Joining me now with analysis is the deputy director of Numbers USA Education and Research Foundation, Chris Chimelinski. Chris, thanks for being here. Um, I want to start with uh, Joe Biden's changed a, a bit uh, since uh, he promised to introduce this immigration bill. Big legislation that might include amnesty for illegal aliens in country. Uh, that seems unlikely, at least right away. What impact will the president's flurry of executive orders have? Well, I think it's, it's, it's only going to make it even more difficult for them to pass some sort of immigration reform, um, mainly through the Senate and the House where the Democrats control. Uh, I think it'll be it'll be fairly easy to to get it through, although I think even if, if legislation reflected what the White House put out in their outline, um, I think that might have even been difficult to get through the House with with a lack of any sort of immigration enforcement. Um, but the Senate is where the tough haul is. Uh, the, you know, they're going to need to pick up at least 10 Republican senators in order to get over a filibuster, um, uh, overcome a filibuster. And at the same time, they're going to need to hold on to the moderates like Kristen Sinema in, in, in Arizona and Joe Manchin in, in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, give me your sense of uh, these statistics, and I want to go over some of them. Regarding illegal immigration, according to the Department of Homeland Security, as of 2013, at least 11.4 million illegals were living here in the United States. Pew puts the number at 11.3 million. Um, and they estimate that at least 8 million illegal aliens are in the U.S. workforce. Now, the pandemic has certainly caused a spike in unemployment for U.S. citizens. Given the way the president is courting amnesty and encouraging foreign workers, what impact would an influx of illegal immigrants mean for the workforce and the economy? Well, as you mentioned, those data points are from about six or seven years ago. So we don't have a recent number, although I think we have pretty good reason to believe that it's somewhere between 11 and 15 million. Still, under the president's uh, proposed outline, 
uh, what he would like to do is grant amnesty to almost all of them. That means lifetime work permits immediately for, you know, 11 million, 12 million, 13 million folks. You mentioned 8 million of them are already holding jobs. Many of them are holding those jobs illegally, obviously, if they're in the country illegally. So they would get immediate mm -hmm. authorization. But then you're opening up the labor force for another three, four, five million workers. Uh, and, and you've got tens of millions of Americans who have not only lost permanent work, but they've they've also seen their hours reduced, their wages reduced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So when you're adding more labor to the labor market, that's only going to hurt those that are looking for work, trying to get more work themselves, because they're going to have to compete mm. without larger against that larger labor force. Mm -hmm. Now, just this week, uh, a federal judge in Texas blocked President Biden's executive order putting a pause on deportations for 100 days. Uh, th this judge issued a 14-day temporary restraining order nationwide. Now, earlier this week, ICE indicated that it was going to ignore that order uh, be because they need to remove, they say, these dangerous criminal aliens from the country. Your reaction, where does this go from here? Yeah, the, the, this order from the judge was interesting. This is this is the sort of judicial warfare that was used in the previous administration, where everything that it seemed that that Trump had signed got challenged in the courts, and the courts almost immediately issued right. a nationwide injunction. But this one in Texas mm -hmm. was for good reason. Um, one of the prior deputy directors at Homeland Security, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, had signed some agreements, enforcement agreements, with these states that guaranteed that they would, that Immigration and Customs Enforcement would enforce the laws in particular states, Texas being one of them. Uh, so, and and that's really what the judge used, and they also used the rationale from 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 the DACA ruling from the Supreme Court that the that the action taken by the Biden administration was 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 careless and, and capricious. So they basically, in essence, rushed their decision. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's it, remember, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, most of the women and, and men who work for ICE, they're law enforcement officers. So they're there to enforce and uphold the rule of law. And they're being told, no, you can't do that. So obviously, there's going to be pushback from ICE. We've now seen pushback from the states that has led to a court-wide, nationwide injunction, and, and we'll have to see what happens from here. Um, but but it's, it's it's a good step in the right direction that that you know they're at least treating these executive orders from Biden the same way that they did in previous administrations. Mm -hmm. Chris, I, I need to get into this business of separating families at the border. Uh, Biden made much hay about this during the last election, but it was the Biden, it was the Obama Biden administration that started this practice. Biden's now saying the government has to work to reunite these families. What gives here? What's the truth? Well, well, for starters, many of the children that are are still uh, separated from quote unquote separated from their parents that are in in the government's custody, uh, they either can't locate the parents or they have located the parents and the parents haven't simply just not come to get right. them, um, or the parents are 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 outside of the country and can't get here to pick up their kids. Um, so so I just I just wanted to make make that point. But unfortunately, our current immigration laws actually requires this. If you're gonna, if you're going to charge people for crossing the border illegally, detain them, and and put them before uh, an immigration judge to have their case heard, um, what do you do with their children if their children come? You're not going to incarcerate the children as well. Uh, and th there's the current Flores settlement agreement that says that the government can only hold children for a certain period of time, so they have to release the Correct. children eventually. So it just by default the law requires that the government, if they're going to enforce the law, the law requires them to separate the parents from the children if these parents choose to cross the border illegally with their minor children. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really it's the law that needs to be reformed. It would be it would be much easier if they allowed the government to detain the families as units, keep them together rather than separating them, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they they also that, that because of that, I think it's a Flores rule that you, you referenced there. Um, there is an incentive and some of these human traffickers, they, they bring children across the border. So it's uh, and I've heard this from border agents. I'm, you know, I'm one of the few reporters who actually been down to the border, interviewed agents, spent time with families, pulled them out of the Rio Grande. Um, when you talk to those agents, they will tell you some of these children are being trafficked and it's up to border enforcement to figure out is this a real family unit or not? And they have to extricate the child from that 
parental group from that family unit to figure out who's who. And in some cases, that's not their biological family. So the government is actually doing a favor, protecting the child in that instance. So there are a lot of complexities here that I think the, you know, children in cages separating families um, line, that jingo, misses. Right. And, and you have to remember that the, the, the situation from which many of these children come to the United States, the situation that they came from, in a lot of cases, they're very critical of the way that, you know, the ICE facilities are. Well, these kids are sleeping in, you know, concrete boxes and, and there's fencing and and but it's still probably better conditions than where these kids came from. Um, but mm -hmm. besides that, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It's uh, the, 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 the human traffickers are using these children as pawns to try to get other people across the border illegally. And, and we've even heard reports that some of the children are being quote unquote recycled. It's a, it's a horrible term when you think about it, but that's what's happening. They're using the children over and over and over because you do, you have like the current administration, for example, is, appears to be completely against any sort of DNA testing to guarantee that the person that the child is actually traveling with is the, the, the child's legal guardian. Mm -hmm. No, it's a critical point. And look, I've been to these facilities. They are not pretty. They are, you know, the, and, the, and the, but these are temporary detainment right. centers when they first come across right. the border. Then if the children are held in government custody, truth be told, they move them to other facilities that are really uh, akin Correct. to summer camps. I mean, they have, you know, ping pong tables and they go outdoors, they play ball. It's a very Soccer different field. thing. And those are privately right. run facilities. People don't fully appreciate what this is because they've never been down there. And, and it, it's up to right. an incumbent right. upon reporting reporters to do more work to show the American people what that, the complexities, and it is complex. There's no, you know, one answer here. Chris, before I let you go, did you find it at all curious that Joe Biden has a bust of Cesar Chavez on his credenza in the Oval Office? What do you make of that? It's, it, it's quite interesting. And, you know, it's part of this whole rewriting history. We'll rewrite the, the parts of history that we want to rewrite and we'll ignore the bad parts of the history that we, we you know, we want to ignore. Um, at, at the end of the day, Cesar Chavez led farm workers down to the border to revolt against people who are crossing the border illegally to take jobs away from, from American farm workers. Um, he, right. he, he had a very aggressive process or, or, or very uh, aggressive thoughts on, on how we should stop illegal immigration especially ones that threaten the American farm worker labor force. Um, so it's quite ironic that, you know, on day one, the Biden administration releases this plan of grant amnesty to folks who are in the country illegally, yet he's sitting in front of a bust of somebody that was, for most of his lifetime, 100 percent opposed to illegal immigration. Yeah, no, because it, it, it diffused and weakened his negotiating power. I mean, he didn't want people competing <laughs> with the, the citizens here and the, the farm workers exactly. that he was organizing, which makes sense. We'll leave it there. Chris Chmielinski, thank you for being here. And uh, you can find more of Chris's work at NumbersUSA.org. Chris, thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. The World Over is now available as a podcast. You can download us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A fun way to encounter the show. That's all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now. Thank you.